seen and come short of his glory, let us therefore humbly confess our sins to him, kneeling as we confess together. Confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We acknowledge that we are responsible for our sinfulness. Have mercy upon us, we pray you. And forgive us by the love which you have shown towards us in Jesus Christ, who for our sake died and rose again. Give us true repentance by the power of your Holy Spirit and enable us to forsake our evil ways and serve you in newness of life. May the almighty and merciful Lord Grant unto you pardon and remission of all your sins, time for amendment of life, and the grace and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Recognizing that God has forgiven us because Jesus, the Lamb of God, has died for us, let us adore him, saying together, have dealt well with your servants, O Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord. Your word is a lamb to our feet. Please, I beg us to rise as we chant Psalms number 121. On page 14, page 14.
Let's let's see it for the only lesson. The only lesson. Hear the word of God as it is written in First Timothy chapter four, reading at verse eleven. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will serve both yourself and your hearers. This is the word of the Lord. We shall rise as to sing the hymn preparing us for the brief exhortation, number 13, hymn number 13 on page 19, a charge to keep. We shall sing the first and the last stanzas, the first and the last stanzas. Father, we thank you for the gift of this morning. It's by grace that we all are alive. Thank you for gathering our clergy from all over Nigeria to have this conference. We pray, O oh God, that as your Holy Spirit speaks to us, you will prepare us for a greater challenge ahead. And your mercies will be with us, even as we lean on you and your guidance. In ministry, we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Please sit. I welcome you all to this conference in Port Harcourt. I know we have been welcomed formally, but it's my pleasure to say you are welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Because we do not have the luxury of time. We want to look at one or two things in this text that is read to us. First Timothy chapter 4, particularly from verse 6. If you point these things out to the brothers, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, brought up in the truths of the faith, and of the good teaching that you may follow, that you have followed. Hallelujah. Effective Anglican ministry in the 21st century. 
Yesterday, our Father in God laid the foundation to this text. And by the grace of God, all that we shall be doing these three days ahead of us, we shall be doing a building on what was started yesterday. The Anglican pastor is faced with two duties in ministry. One, he is faced with the duty of comforting those who are discouraged and are the verge of falling away from the faith. And we must know this, that Jesus Christ called us to comfort his church, to build his people, and strengthen those who are falling away. This duty, we must not take it lightly, my brothers and sisters, but we must take it with every sense of responsibility so that we will do what he has called us to do. Number two, the Anglican clergyman must discipline himself in godliness so that you will serve both yourself and those you preach to. In verse 17 to 16 of our text, Paul stressed this fact to his young son, Pastor Timothy. The Anglican clergyman is faced with such challenge. Therefore, we must not be indolent in our calling and duties. Beloved, our calling is not because we are qualified. Our calling is because God deems it fit and qualifies you as a minister to serve his church. And in this capacity, there is the possibility that we shall begin or we have started feeling some feelings of inadequacy in us, particularly bearing in mind the challenges that we are faced with in our nation today. Young Timothy had this challenge and so his father in God had to speak to him and encourage him in this regard he probably must have felt incapacitated unqualified and not having ability to exert his duties and so Paul who is a father indeed encouraged Timothy to stand firm in the face of the challenges of his time to speak the word of God, to speak encouragement to the people of God, and stand as a man of God. You are a man of God. We all are men of God and women of God. And this is what God is expecting us to do. Yes, times will come and the times are around us that we will have this feeling of inability. We are not qualified. Is God not there for us? He is all the time with you and with us. And so it shall be in the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, it is good that the man of God feels at some point some sense of incapacitation. It helps the man of God to truly lean on the Holy Spirit. It helps you to truly trust in God. It helps you to truly look up to Jesus Christ. Just as Timothy did look unto God. Timothy felt like Moses, who complained, God, I'm not qualified. Look at the challenges. Look at my life. Look at Pharaoh standing before me. How do I go back to him? And will your people even believe in me? But God encouraged him that he was going to be with him, even as Jesus has said to us that he will be with us till the close of the age. And therefore, my brothers, we are gathered here in the presence of God 
knowing fully the challenges of our nation, knowing fully the challenges of our generation. And sometimes you speak to the congregation, the members, and they behave as if you are not speaking anything. And sometimes they despise even your giftings. They despise even the words you speak to them. They feel you have not said anything very well to them. Particularly when they measure yourself and some other persons. Do not feel disappointed. The Lord God is still working through you. He only wants you to stand as a generate, regenerated child of God. Apart from being a pastor, first and foremost, you are a child of God. Hallelujah. And if you know this fact, then you will stand tall in the face of these challenges that we are facing in Nigeria and the world around us. God wants you to remain a true servant of God. One who is regenerated in his word. And remain that status quo until when your walk is over here on the side of eternity. He wants you to be faithful again. In the midst of the things we go through, how faithful shall we remain? God is looking up to us and counting on us to remain faithful. One of the things and the challenges we face is when we start to measure our success with others. Remember, Jesus never called anyone to succeed. He called us to faithfulness. He called us to stand looking up to him, not looking at what other people are doing. The moment you begin to look at the su other people's success, honestly, you'll be discouraged. You'll feel nothing is happening around me. Something is happening around you. You are doing work. You are doing God's ministry. Hallelujah. So have this courage and stand. He called us not because we have ability, he called us because you are available. He looks at men who are available. He looks at women who are available. And once our availability is complete, God releases his power and he stands with us and we face all the challenges of life. This morning, as we continue to hear the men chosen by God to speak to us and to challenge us. May we open our hearts. May we open our minds. And the Lord shall pour his riches of his glory upon us. And by the time we are rising from this camp, we shall go back men who are qualified in the spirit to still do this work in this dangerous generation. May it be so to us. And may the spirit of God pour his grace upon our heart. And encourage us in times like this so that we shall remain faithful servants unto him. That day when he shall say, welcome, faithful servant. He will not tell you, welcome, successful servant. He will measure our work by the faithfulness we live with. And may this be our focus and the purpose of our life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, we thank you because of this encouragement. And as we continue to hear from men whom you have prepared to bless our lives and encourage us in ministry as Paul did encourage Timothy. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. Strengthen us and tell us that you are the Lord of life. And as we hold on to you, we shall not fail you through Jesus Christ our Lord.
Please let us kneel as we pray. Today is a twelfth week. I will enter his gate with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his court with praise. I will say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice as made me. My Lord has made me glad. He has oh yes Lord I am so Rejoice. Can we begin to thank God? Can we begin to appreciate Him for the wonderful things He has done for us? In particular, Johnny Messies granted us. Some have been here since on Sunday. Thank Him. Adore Him. Thank you for the night we passed through. It is by his grace, by his mercy, that we are not consumed. Thank him that we are alive in the land of the living this morning. We are not ignorant of the fact that not all who went in last night have come to see this day. But by the grace of God, here we are, the second day of this program. Just appreciate God. Just say, God, thank you. You have done for us what no man can do. Just thank him. Thank him for waking you up from the right side of the bed. It's a miracle. For bringing you here is by his privilege. So we get to thank this God and appreciate him. Let us pray for our country, Nigeria. We are all Nigerians. We know what we are passing through in this country. Pray for the peace of God. Pray for the love of God upon us, our leaders, in particular our President Muhammadu, the Vice Osibanjo, and the Governor of the State, Nyesum, the Deputy Palibo. Pray for God's wisdom upon their lives. The Word of God says that when the righteous will rule, the people will rejoice. Pray and ask God to better this country for us. The same way, let us pray for this church that has gathered here since yesterday. Today is the second day. Pray for the church. Pray for God's enablement, His wisdom, knowledge upon us. In particular, pray for the head of this church, our primate, Henry. Pray for him as he arrives today. Ask God for Johnny Messies. Remember our Archbishop, the Archbishop of this province of Niger Delta, blessing. And our own diocesan, wisdom. Pray that God in his infinite mercy will continue to lead and direct them aright. That the church of God will continue to move forward and no gate of hell shall prevail against it. Today is St. Bartholomew. In the midst of challenges, difficulties, obstacles, God granted him 
grace to preach the word of God without compromise. As ministers of God, we know what we are passing through in this country. Challenges. Ask that God will give us the same grace he gave to Bartholomew to preach. Pray, God, I need this grace to preach your word without any fear of contradiction. Commit this program into the hands of God as we continue today. Pray for our resource persons. Pray and ask God to take absolute charge of this arena and all we are going to do today. Let it be to his glory. Pray for the food we eat. After now we shall go for our meals. Nobody will contact any form of sickness in cause of this food. No food poison. As many that have come here safely will go back safely without being sick. Pray for those of them who cook for us. Finally, can you pray for yourself? Pray for yourself. Whatever you feel that man cannot do, God can do it for you. There is nothing that is impossible with God. Put yourselves into the hands of God. Pray for his mercy. Pray for his grace upon your life. And so eternal reality, indeed we are grateful for allowing us to see this day we have not seen before in our life. Thank you for sound sleep given to us last night. Thank you also for waking us up from the right side of the bed this day. Thank you for the journey mercy so granted us for this place. Father, we pray for our country, Nigeria. We pray for the church gathered here. We bring our individual needs unto you. We ask that you help us in all our challenges and difficulties of life that you see us through. Blessed be your holy name, Heavenly Father. Be thou exalted and glorified. For we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Shall we all say the grace together in fellowship? Love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit all evermore. Amen. We take him number 11 and we shall take this morning offering. Him number 11 on page 18. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. Oh, yeah. 
stanza 3 stanza 3 stanza 3 let us pray. Lord, we thank you that throughout this day, your word shall keep us, and your mercy shall be nigh us. We ask that your peace will be upon our hearts and upon this city, with our families that we left back at home. Defend and protect us from every peril of this day through Jesus Christ our Lord. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of God and the knowledge of his son Jesus Christ our Lord.
the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. bring this service to a close as we sing from our booklet number two, hymn number two. Faith of our fathers. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. We trust our faith on you. Guide and direct us throughout the activities of today. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. We want to, on behalf of the National Planning Committee, Dr. Showale, and the LOC Chairman, His Grace, Dr. Inda, to really appreciate those who conducted this morning's worship service, led by our able prolocutor. We want to appreciate the clergy that assisted him. We want to appreciate also the choristers of the diocese who are here to support this wonderful program and we pray that the almighty God will continue to bless you all in Jesus name people of God we are now 
the starting the program for this All Anglican Clergy Conference. And so, if you open to page 3 of your program, you will see itemized for us this day, all the activities for this uh, wonderful day, the first day. Yesterday was just a welcome service. Today is actually the beginning of the beginnings. And I pray that none of us will be found wanting throughout these programs in the name of Jesus Christ. We also want to now, without wasting much time, to say that please, we are going to take all the programs and we are going to be time conscious. We are going to be time conscious. So please, permit me to introduce our Father in God, who is going to take us through the three sessions of our Bible studies for this All Anglican 2020, 2021 Clergy Conference. And he is none other than the Bishop of Kaba Diocese, a mentor, a teacher, a revivalist, and the person of the Right Reverend Dr. Stephen Akobe. Please, let's give him a better clap offering. Hallelujah. Daddy, you are welcome, sir. The Lord be with you. We have been told we'll be time, time conscious. This is 8.40. Is it 8.40? No, not 8.40. 8.20. I have one hour, so I'll be time conscious. I should be leaving the stage by 9.20. 9.20. I'd like to thank the Lord for grace to be here and for the opportunity to come to share together with us in the study of God's Word. I want to thank the planning committee for giving me this invitation. And I do not in any way take this lightly at all. And I pray that the Lord will guide us and lead us as we study from His Word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I would request some very strong young clergy to please come and help me move this so that I can be in the center. Shall we pray? Let your living water flow over my soul. Let your Holy Spirit come and take control in every situation that has troubled my mind. All my cares and burdens unto you. I rule Jesus Can I hear you sing to Jesus? Jesus Jesus Sing to the Father Spirit, we welcome you this morning, and we ask that you speak to us in your word, and let the word bring life and light to us, in the name of the Father, and of the Spirit, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Bible study is on page 22, we would move quickly, so we can get to the end of it. I've deliberately taken the entire chapter of uh, 4 of First Timothy. For our consideration and we've broken that into three parts so for this morning we're looking at from verse 1 up to verse 6 but there is the general introduction on page 22 and obviously you know that the author of this book is the Apostle Paul himself it's clear from chapter 1 2 of 1st Timothy is also the same author to Titus 
It's clear there. So 1 Timothy 1, 1. 2 Timothy 1, 1 and Titus 1, 1 clearly show to us without any dispute or argument that the Apostle Paul is the author of these epistles. Secondly, the recipient is Timothy, a young man between the age of 34 and 39 was put in Ephesus by Paul to contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the apostles and unto the church. And it appears that Paul was the one who led Timothy to Christ Timothy had dual origin, his mother being Jew, his father being a Greek from Lystra. And when Paul met him at the first encounter, there about Paul witnessed to him, ministered to him, and he became converted and became a Christian. By the time Paul returned and found Timothy again, he had to circumcise Timothy because he sensed upon the life of Timothy the call of God, the spirit of God, and the power of God. And so he circumcised Timothy and took him on his missionary journey. In fact, Timothy became a companion and a co-sender of at least six of the Pauline epistles. And so, for, for Paul, Timothy was not just a companion, but a son in the faith. One who had been with him, one whom he had raised, one whom he had discipled, one whom he had poured his life into. And no wonder in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 following, Paul said to Timothy, I am now ready to be offered, to be sacrificed. My life is being poured out. I have fought the good fight. I have completed the race and I have kept the faith. And there awaits me a crown of righteousness. So Paul trusted so much in Timothy, believed in him and his capacity, and that he was able to deliver. And so one of the things we must take home in this Bible study is who is that person that you are discipling? Who is that person that you are mentoring? Who is that person that you are emptying your life into and you are preparing as the next generation of believer, next generation of a Christian, next generation of a follower of the word of God? Who have you saved? Who have you preached to? Each time that we stand to preach, whether in church or anywhere, are there people that you know deliberately by your preaching, by your teaching, and of course, obviously, by your life? You have come to bring them to Christ. So Paul had many sons and daughters in Christ. And what was the purpose? The purpose was very simple. It was for Timothy to stand and fight heresy. To combat heresy and to confront false teachers. And in Ephesus, there were at least two or three sorts of heresies. Glossicism was there. Decadent Judaism was there. And you have false ascetism. And now, Gnosticism has some, was something that had stayed so long in the church. And so it was not new. And it was such a kind of cult, a kind of teaching, a kind of behavior or belief that was very syncretic. And you know, even in our own days, syncretism has entered into the church in a very subtle manner. And sometimes it's difficult to decipher and distinguish and make a dichotomy between syncretism and what is not syncretic. And so, Glossism was the kind of thing that said, look, divided the word into two, dualism. There was matter and there was a spirit world. And matter, of course, was evil. And the, 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 the sad thing about it is that the world, the creation for Gnostics was that God was not involved in creation. He was not involved in making the things that he made because matter is evil. So there was a lesser God who was involved in creation and God was just aloof. I mean, that's, that's wrong. That's against scripture. They didn't stop there. They said Jesus was also dual in, in nature. That he was a spirit and the human form came only upon him while he was here on earth. In fact, they also thought that the spirit form of Christ was there and at the uh, baptism you know that spirit came and then before crucifixion that spirit left I mean if our faith is built on such teachings it's wrong the question is what do you teach in your various churches what do you tell people because teaching and foundation and the things that they hear day in and day out are very important these Gnostics were teaching false religion and of course, they were saying that there was a hidden truth, secret knowledge that you needed to get to liberate yourself from this evil world. And 
they were form, falling away from the faith and forming their own churches and misleading and misguiding people. And Paul said, said to Timothy, no, 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 no. The Lord has helped us. He has helped us to build this church and to build this faith in the hearts of people. What we received from the apostles, what we received from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, all of the sufferings and the pains, and of course the death of Christ, should not be a waste. What about ascetism? People trying to teach a, a kind of way in which you punish the body. You, you, you pamel the body, but not in a godly fashion. So that the body becomes you know, strong, or rather the spirit becomes strong, and the body is abused. And so Timothy needed to stand to confront all of these teachings. And here we have definitions of um, effective ministry or effective minister. Let me read that quickly. It's on page 23. An effective minister is a faithful minister. In other words, another word for effectiveness is faithfulness. Is a faithful minister who is faithful to his relationship with his master. In other words, an effective minister is faithful, but is one who is connected, who is related with the Lord Jesus Christ, who knows him as his Lord and personal Savior, and daily watches and daily prays. That connection with heaven is clear, strong, and is a continuous one. It's a daily one. That's a faithful minister, an effective minister. He's not, not, not only faithful to his master, but he's faithful to the house of his master. The Bible says to us that Moses was faithful in the house of God. So an effective minister is faithful to his master, but also faithful in the house of God, in his ministry, in his domain, in the place where God has posted him. Can I say very quickly, each time the bishop posts you, to a church, to a parish, to an adjacent. Please never in your mind think that it's the bishop who has posted you there. It is God Almighty who has posted you there for the sake of his people that they may hear the word of God and that they may make heaven. So, faithful also to his calling. Faithful to his calling. You know, that the Bible says to us that Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. Clear calling. Clear focus, clear target of ministry. People of God, it becomes suicidal and it becomes terrible and it becomes so frustrating when a clergyman does not know his area of calling. And there are areas of calling. Generally, in Anglican church, we are all called to be ordained as what? As pastor. But you know something? Even in that large ministry of calling unto ordination, there are specific giftings that will distinguish and determine your calling. And in that area of calling, when you stand, you make a full proof of your ministry. And that's what Paul was also saying to Timothy. Make a full proof. Let no one despise your youth. Let no one look down on your age. You've got a ministry. Hands were laid upon you. We saw the anointing. We saw the grace. We saw the gift of God over your life. Don't waste it. Don't be afraid. Stand. And the same words are said to us today. What is your call? What is your ministry? What are the gifts that you have? Stand in there and make a full proof of that ministry. And then finally, he's faithful to the kingdom of his master. People of God, there's only one kingdom. The kingdom of Christ. The bishop is not the one who has called you. Yes, he ordained you, but he's not the one who has called you. You are not called to labor for your bishop. You are called to labor for the kingdom of God. Please note it. You are not called to labor for any human being or any group of persons or any tribe. Your call is simple. Call to labor for the kingdom. If you are called to labor for your tribe, go and join politics. If you want to labor for any human being, find another job to do. But if you are in the ministry, by the ordination, and by the grace that you have received, and by the stipends that you receive, and all the comfort that you get, you must labor for the kingdom. Each time that Jesus spoke and preached, he said, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, everything he was doing, even when he did miracles, when he fed the 4,000, the 5,000, when he healed people, he pointed them straight to the kingdom. 
Because many can be healed and go to hellfire. Many can be wealthy and go to hellfire. Many may experience the miraculous here on earth and go to hellfire. But when we point them to a kingdom that is not built by hands, a kingdom that does not, you know, fall, but a kingdom that stands and stands forever, then when they know that our journey here on earth does not end here, but it continues in heaven. No wonder Paul could say boldly, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1, 21. So a faithful minister or effective minister is one who is productive. And you know, in science or in economics, we can measure productivity. So when a minister is faithful and effective, we can say that minister is what? Productive. Who measures your productivity? Is he your bishop? Yes, we do. And that's why sometimes we prefer you, canon, archdeacon, or whatever. Because we think that you are productive. But you know, the greatest preferment you can ever receive, the greatest commendation, is when heaven says to you, well done, faithful and obedient servant. For many of us as clergy, we have been weighed and we are falling short of the requirements. And God is asking, shall I allow this tree to stay another one year or I should destroy it now? And maybe just by the prayer of certain people, they are begging God, allow him for one more year. Paraventure, he will bring fruits. Because each time God comes to look for fruits in our lives and in our ministry, does he find the fruits? Or he says, I want to cut it down and replace him. A faithful minister is productive, is hardworking, is committed, is dedicated, and is, de is devoted to the ministry and to the call. Some of us have become productive in our bank accounts. Productive in regards to how many houses we have. And all the other things of life that we have gathered. I have nothing against wealth, materialism, but I say this to you, cling clear. If you are focused in ministry, particularly in ministry, I don't know about politics, I don't know about medicine, I don't know about engineering, but if your focus in ministry is about material gains, I tell you, you will get it, but it will kill you. You will get it, but it will kill you. You will get it, you will go to hellfire. Listen to me. When there is too much money, you become confused. And money has a spirit. And the spirit of money, when it's too much, it controls your thinking, it controls your faculty, it controls your ministry, and it takes the whole of you. And I can say to you, you cannot do the will of God. Why do I know that? Because when John the Baptist came, he says, have you gone to see him? He said, what did you see? He says he was a man living in the wilderness, dressed in camel skin, and was eating white honey and locust. People of God, let me say very quickly as we move on. There is a set lifestyle for anyone who is called to be a minister. It cannot be the same like a politician. It cannot be the same as a billionaire who is in business. It is never the same. There is a set lifestyle for a man who is called to be a man of God. Find that lifestyle. And once you find it, you will see that your ministry begins to blossom. An effective person does not just know what to do, they know the why. The why determines your what. If your why is shaky, if your why is not clear, why a ministry, then your what will be in various shapes and forms and manners. What is the why? That's the purpose. For what purpose has God called you? It is the purpose that will determine the what. And can I say to us very quickly, I always say that very quickly, is that the place where you are has to do with purpose. And that is the why. So if you, you know, kind of manipulated your way to get to where you are, then your why has a problem. But if you let God put you where he wants to put you, then you will see your why every time determining your what. And your what will come up and there will be what new every morning. Because there is a purpose in ministry defined by the why that God has given to you. You know, a faulty picture of the Lord Jesus Christ produces a faulty picture of ministry. 
I was sharing last week with a group of people and I said to them, when my daughter was much younger, she used to draw me on a piece of paper. How does she draw me? She draw a circle and put, you know, and hands and legs. And she would show me and say, Daddy, see, I've drawn you. I said, oh, beautiful. But the question is, is that what I look like? No. But in her mind, that is her best imagination, her best description, and her best ability to sketch me on paper. People of God, whatever is your best ability of understanding of Christ and of the Word of God, is also your best dispensation of the same Word to those who listen to you. So if it's a faulty understanding, if it's not so clear, that understanding of the Gospel and of the Lord Jesus Christ, each time you stand to preach, you also give a faulty you know, dispensation of His Word. And that affects the whole of your ministry. Let's quickly move to study one. Now, study one says the topic is how to be effective in combating false teachers or teachings. And the text is 1 Timothy 1 to 6. And the aims are there, two of them, to expose false teachings and popular religion. To teach and show how to combat false teachings. I'd like to read the text to us. 1 Timothy 4, 1 to 6. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times shall some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience snared with the hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God had created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained and so that's the key the last verse that we read if thou shall put the brethren in remembrance of these things and these things form our first study our second study and our third study timothy was asked to put the brethren to put the church in remembrance of certain things that were going to affect the kingdom of god affect their understanding of the gospel of christ and he needed to do that and to stand up to do that and then if he did that he will be a good minister of the Lord Jesus Christ who would become nourished up in the words of faith. Now, Paul was saying to Timothy, Timothy, as you teach, you learn. As you try to combat and stop false teachings, Gnosticism and ascetism and all of that, you are also learning. And that's very interesting, really. That you who is a man of God, who is a pastor, should not come to the pulpit with the understanding that you know everything. Should not labor among the people which you labor, thinking that I am superior to them, I am higher than them, I am better than them, and I know everything. But rather, what do you do? Humble yourself, that amongst them you may also learn. Amongst them you may also discover certain things that will help you in your preaching, that will help you in your teaching and so Christianity has been performed by all kinds of distortions all kinds of manipulations all kinds of you know mercantilism all kinds of the idea of revision and it didn't start today it's been there before now and can I say to you it will not end it will continue and probably even get worse so you are thrown in the midst of all of this confusion of different strands of pastors and different kinds of teachings and different kinds of churches all surrounding you where you are laboring. And so Paul tells Timothy, this is the water, this is the ocean in which you have been thrown. You must swim to save yourself, but not just yourself, 
but save the people of God who will listen to what you teach and what you say. Can I also say to us again that when you are a pastor in that location where the bishop has posted you by God, you're not just a pastor for only Anglicans. You're a man of God for the community. The community has to look up to you and to see you as answer to issues, circumstance, and situation. So that if your ministry is only confined to that your local church, to that your church where it is in, in that community, and people else do not hear you, do not know where you stand and what you teach and what you believe, and when there are issues in town, they can't say, let us hear from the Anglican priest. Let us hear from the Anglican pastor. Let us go to the Anglican pastor and let him say something to us. In other words, each time that you stand and your sermon only sounds Anglican, please, can you resign and find another job to do? Because there's no what is called Anglican sermon. It's Bible. The word of God. Because when you get to heaven, there's no Anglicanism. There will be the church of God. Neither am I condemning what we have. No, what we have is fantastic and superb. I'm a full Anglican, full-fledged. I believe in all our doctrines and teachings. And I practice them as well. But I'm saying to you, when you handle the word of truth, let that truth come out. So, that's what we are. What do you do? Paul tells Timothy, knowledge and application of sound biblical truths contained in scripture. Knowledge, application of sound biblical truths contained in scripture, not contained in theological books. Some theological books are heresy. Hope you know that by now. There are books that you pick on certain areas of theology. They do not contain the mind of God. Of course, there are those that contain the mind of God. So if your sermon is always based on theological books, based on commentaries, only on commentaries, and you don't wait for the Spirit to speak, you see, the value of our theological training is that it gives us a base it gives us a foundation and we are taught that after getting that base and that foundation in other words when you look at commentaries look at theoretical books and everything what you are trying to find out is that what is the background what is the history that is not in the bible what is the view that you know and then you now do what listen to the spirit and so paul tells timothy the spirit speaketh and the spirit is talking and the spirit is making clear and bold certain things that in the last days there will be a falling away and this falling away is not just one person leaving the church but is that that one person who teaches the wrong thing and does the wrong thing is taking others together with him so timothy hear the spirit timothy be alert and be awake to the spirit. So the question to ask ourselves again this morning is that as an Anglican priest, do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you know the Holy Spirit? Do you have the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Do you believe in the dispensation and the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you understand that there's nothing else that can keep you strong, consistent, dedicated, committed in the ministry without the power of the Holy Spirit? Without the indwelling and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. That on a day-to-day -day basis, you go before God in prayer, Lord, fill me again with your Spirit. Fill me again with your presence. Fill me again with your anointing. That you have a connection in the study of his word on a daily basis in which you sit by the word and you study it and you hear what the Spirit is saying. People of God, ministry is tough. And I can say to you, if it's not tough to you, then think twice whether you are truly called and you are doing ministry. Ministry is tough. 
there are powers there are principalities there are authorities there are dominions there are people who come to church and they are sitting on their heads and they are watching you unless the holy ghost opens your eyes you will not see paul was saying to timothy you need to understand what the spirit is saying and you need to address the matter based on the spirit of christ when you do you can confront them because it is not a battle face to face by show of strength or power no it is the power of the spirit in the word of god in which when they teach you counter what they teach by the knowledge of the word that you have and people of god they are teaching all kinds of things today and our members are buying and our members are following and our members are falling and our members are leaving yes they are why is it so easy for an anglican member to leave the church and simply go and join another church tomorrow and he says once i was blind but now i can see you know the reason is because all the time he spent in our church is most likely he never got that kind of powerful teaching that kind of powerful revelation of the word of god each time maybe his pastor mounted the pulpit he was to stand and say well the lord be with you uh, today is St. Bartholomew's Day. And you know, Bartholomew was a good man. He actually preached. And uh, once he preached, people became born again. And then, um, well, he died. And then after he died, well, of course, he went to heaven. So let your life be like Bartholomew. And then if, if your life becomes like that, you can be sure you're going to heaven. And by the way, don't forget that our, our church is very dirty. And we need to, to clean our church. And then we need to build another, this one, yeah? And that's what the man heard for the last 20 years. For the first time, he goes to one church. And the man says, Bartholomew was a man of God. A man of power, full of the Holy Spirit. Bartholomew was a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it was because of his preaching to a king that he was arrested and that he died. Excuse me, sir. Which one will you choose? So ask yourself, what are you feeding your members with every Sunday that is giving them constipation and kwashoko and diarrhea and purging? And they go to another church and that man heals their diarrhea, stops their purging and stops everything that they, that they are going through. And they say, I will sit here. Oh. I will stay here. Oh. I pray for you this morning. Every strange spirit that has taken over members of your church that is not of Christ I begin to command those spirits to die by fire in the name of Jesus Christ I pray for a resurgence of the word of God the power of the word of God and the spirit of Christ in our church in the name of Jesus Christ and so when Paul told no I'm taking my full time the service took full time so I'll take my full time <laughs> at all <laughs> Don't mind that distraction. <laughs> and so Paul tells Timothy that ministry is also warfare. It's contending with those forces. And the only way to do that is to know the word of God. Feed on it daily. As you feed on the word of God, he says, feed on it consistently. And he says, Timothy, teach the people the word. There are things I've highlighted in the very bold lines there. It's for you to consider them and to look at them. I said, under major issues in our text, divine warning by the Spirit of Christ. I said, this falling away or people leaving the church must never be on account of the negligence of the clergyman and his failure to hear from the Spirit failure to preach the sound gospel failure to offer quality leadership and spirituality to his congregation that can make people do what fall away remember that paul in acts chapter 16 there was a girl he found who kept saying these are the men of god listen to them listen to them we are told that at the point god got angry uh, paul got angry and did what and rebuked the spirit like, like I said, there are spirits in our churches that must be rebuked. In Acts chapter 13, the same thing he did for Bar Jesus, who was what, trying to hinder the word of God from being preached or being spoken. 
Paul tells Timothy, knowledge is great. Be strong and courageous to do what? To oppose these people. And he tells Timothy at the end, the instruction that you must have and you need to follow is what? The salvation of souls. That should be your target. How to save souls. Secondly, equipping the saints. And truly, brothers, this is our ministry. We have no other business in the church but to bring souls to Christ. And secondly, to do what? To equip them for the master, for the work of ministry, for service in his vineyard, for them to discover their gifts, to discover their callings, and to discover their talents. Can I say again very quickly that the pastor must see himself as a facilitator, not a man who does it all. If you have to leave your church and to attend a diocesan program or something or whatever it is, and you're not going to be around on Sunday morning, if the church where your pastor cannot function in your absence, you're a bad leader. If you have been a facilitator, one who is with the, with the body and the desire to save souls and to equip those who are saved in discipleship and all of that, whenever you are not around, they should be able to do what? Function properly. And in fact, each time you sit back and to watch people take turns to do certain things, you should be able to see in what they do that they are doing it sometimes even better than you would have done. That shows that you have invested in their lives. Paul was able to trust Timothy to be in Ephesus as a young minister that he would deliver. He trusted Titus to be in Crent to do what? To also deliver. God is also trusting you that in the place where you are, he expects you to do what? To deliver. May God help us in Jesus' name. Let's look at our questions for discussion. Question one. Give some examples of erroneous and strange teachings within our communion today. Very quickly. Who is taking Mike around? Examples of erroneous, ungodly, strange teachings in our church. Who is answering? We don't have enough time, so let's not waste the time or kill the time we have. Just raise your hand, the mic will come to you. Don't be afraid. I, I am, I am, for today, I'm your bishop, so you are covered. Say what you want to say. Forget that Bishop Fagwemi is here. If you are from his diocese, forget about him being here. Today, I'm your bishop, and today, I give you liberty. <laughs> yes, sir. There's a hand over there. Just, yes, yeah, step forward so that we can save time. Okay, use mine, use mine. Second person, where are you? Please come. One of the erroneous uh, stations in Anglican Church today yes. is praying and clapping. Praying, praying and clapping. Okay. Praying and clapping. Why I say so is that you cannot go to your father or your mother to demand something from him. And you, when you stand in the midst of your father or your mother demanding something from him, you'll be clapping. Okay. That is wrong. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. That is the prayer and the clap. Because in, in our diocese, I don't see, so I don't understand what that means. Yes. Yes, sir. <laughs> so maybe from his diocese, we can demonstrate that we know. <laughs> yes, brother. Thank you, sir. To me, one of the first teachings that is going on amidst the church today is that once you are saved, once you are a Christian, you can never backslide again. Or once you are a Christian, you cannot sin. Your heaven is sure. They don't give room that ah, it is possible for flesh to at least, but the grace is there to come back to the Lord. Okay, thank you. I think you're not, you're not being practical enough. I think you are pretending. Because you are the ones in the parishes. What are those teachings, strange teachings, new doctrines that have crept into our church? And I can give you one or two examples. Yes, sir. That, I'll take that for the last person speaking. A senior clergyman was teaching his congregation that God's judgment is when all the good you did in life 
will be added at one side and all the evil the sins you did in life are put on one side and the good passes the bad by one one percent that you are qualified for heaven that's a very nice teaching anyway <laughs> people of god in my opinion in my opinion i think we're beginning to teach that if you are rich you can make heaven am i correct i think we teach that sometimes that once you have money whatever you do does not matter you make heaven i think we're also teaching that come the way you are it does not matter how you dress particularly our ladies just come the way you are god understands everything and so we see all kinds of whatever then we are also bringing some of the syncretic practices of certain churches you know there's place for oil in our church we now bring oil we bring water we bring handkerchief we bring all kinds of things and people pray on these things and they say it will work miracle for you i think magic is beginning to enter into our church where we're practicing magic and there's a resurgence of idol worship also in our church atr is coming up and some of the things that we do in the church even as we run the service even as the clergyman conducts the service the anglican ethos and the anglican doctrine is sometimes not there there is a mixture of everything in other words whatever works is what we need to do but that is wrong you need to be, be careful and to watch that there are no erroneous or strange teachings by the word you preach and by the daily practice of members of our church there's a hands up there can i hear you quickly question two somebody please get ready to answer that one thank you my lord because within the communion we we'll see maybe because of the dispensation of this uh, coronavirus we had the teaching of being in a hurry to leave the church 20 minutes 30 minutes hurry 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 let us go you we water down the system the the, the the spirit we water down the message everything just just be in a hurry let us go the people will leave this same church and we'll go to a meeting but just let let us just leave and they go out sometimes service is going on people are discussing outside and, and we, we, we keep on teaching close on time close on time yeah I, I i see what you mean being in a hurry because of the times it requires wisdom okay so what i would just say to close on that please watch whatever you teach there are people in parts of yoruba land who believe in what they call orioke mountain and the idea is that until you are on the mountain your prayers cannot be answered and there are prophets on the mountains for me that is erroneous teaching okay and i wish you could bring them up because you are in the parish you know those are erroneous teachings they're not they're not scriptural i think again i see the the dressing that colors our church today the way that even the clergy dress sometimes for service i think is also part of erroneous teaching because of time we would skip that and go on is the ministry of the holy spirit well established in our church today is it well established the ministry and the place of the holy spirit is it well established in our communion quickly there's a hand here two hands well i personally i think no okay uh, why one you realize that sometimes you have contentions with uh people who have certain beliefs in your church or, or even sometimes your fellow clergymen who are rigid and stuck on a particular pattern and kind of thinking and methodology or style so once you don't do according to how they feel they feel you are diverting you are just not this is not anglican you're just not doing it right you are spoiling it 
So somehow, somehow the gift of the Spirit, expressing yourself in the Spirit and, you know, is not fully uh, 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 utilized in the church. Even our members are already hypnotized, so, so to say. I'm sorry, so, uh, it's time to be corrected. Somehow they have grown with that mentality that when you come up and you say, we want to change this thing now, let's try to do it. They are so rigid that they tell you, we have been used to this thing as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be. This is how it has been. You're correct, sir. Yes, sir. Um, like, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, like what you emphasized, the Spirit of God is not allowed to fully function. In the church? In the church. By Why? Who? By who? Hmm? By who? That's what I'm explaining. By okay. how? Um, waiting on God is a virtue. You don't lead God and you don't determine the pace of God. If God decides to reveal to you in two weeks, and you cannot wake in two weeks, and you hurry or in one day, then you are going with your own opinion. Waiting on God is a very, very important thing. For decisions, for movements, you want to do a project, what is God? What is the definite word from God for you? Okay. Yes. One more. Yes, sir. The question said... In no, the, answer, answer, answer. The, the answer, I, I, to me, I would say to some churches, the spirit is fully established. Why to some? They, they doubt it. There is a doubt to some clergy and to some members. All right. It, yes. Thank you. Now, let me say this quickly. Um, the, 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 the growth of any church does not matter what denomination it is the growth of any church is determined is determined now of course the Holy Spirit God the Father, God the Son is, you know all of that is established but it's determined apart from when we say God it's determined largely by the quality and the capacity of the leaders period I don't want to mention denominations, but there are certain denominations that each time you move one pastor and bring another, the church does not go back. If, if anything, they increase. But it's a sad commentary on our communion that each time a bishop does transfer and posting and takes pastor A from a particular church and brings another one, sometimes the record is all that the labors of pastor a the second pastor will kill all of that and the church will be ready for interment when the bishop sends a third pastor to begin to say no don't do interment yet bring the church out of the out, out of the coffin let us begin revival all of all afresh there are different kinds of pastors in our communion those who do maintenance ministry they don't rock the boat let my people go do your thing i do my thing when it's time to leave i leave then there are those who are born killers ordained killers gifted killers put them in the church they kill the church anywhere you post them they are killing the church and there are those who are you know building and that's why our church is not growing as fast as it ought to grow some of us as clergy we have expired we need to retire we're not delivering. We're not de and, and this is not about structure. Structures are good. This is about the souls of men. Each time somebody dies in our houses and they call and say, my Lord Bishop, so 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 person has died. Chiefs this, that one has died. The first question is, I hope they got born again. I hope they are going to heaven. Does that bother you? For me, it bothers me as a bishop. It bothers me as a person in this church. That when you compare our church side by side with some of these churches that came yesterday, they are fantastic. And we are doing what? We are just like marking time. So the place of the Holy Spirit is not just in falling down and standing up. No, it is a ministry that must be understood by leadership and by the clergyman. And once you allow the Spirit to move, you will bring in the same program every year. But every year, there is a dimension. Every year there is a testimony. Every, every year there is miraculous happening. 
Because that program is not just man-made. It's a program that is baited in the Holy Spirit. Soak in the power of the Spirit. And you have heard. You have received. And each time the program happens, people are testifying and say, wow, we thank God. Wow, we give thanks to God. Let's move on because of time. Why do we still have mass exodus in our communion? Particularly of young people. Despite all we are doing. It's related to question two. So those who didn't answer before, can answer now. You have not answered before, right? Okay, quickly. Up, forgive me. Shout. No microphone upstairs. Forgive me. Forgive me, I'm sorry. You know the church, the way it's shaped. Okay, this way. Come down, come down, so that I can give you. Give them, give that man, give that man. Give, see. No, this man. Zero. Because I'm looking at time. My Lord, I want to be I, obedient. I, I know we're on question three. I also felt that question four will be following me, but let me quickly say two things. Number one, the issue of Exodus has been a long time story. And it's truly, it can be established that in some of our churches there are Exodus of youths everywhere, but we also know that this is not true everywhere. But why we have that problem, one of the reasons is that even the persons in our church don't appreciate the effort of their pastors. You will okay. call them for program, they won't come. Okay. At the end of the day, they go to another church, get something that is not as effective as our own is going on. Yes. So that's one big problem. So what is that living. thing that is making them then number two, my, number two, my Lord, yes. another problem that I found is this culture, do I call it our nature? That we have so many things lined up in our church services and the message or the real word of God the teaching is given the most minimum time. It is the problem of the clergy. It's more less time. It is the problem of the clergy. Listen to me. Listen to me. I go to churches in our diocese and I look at their program and they spend three hours. And in, in those three hours, ask the question, how much time was given for the word? How much time was given for prayer? How much time was given for things that are spiritual? And I said, no, 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 no. You must adjust. Listen, church is like a company. Church is like a business. That is the attitude of these Pentecostal pastors. It is like business. They, they are conscious of even the setting of the church. Whether it's a beauty. Listen, please take time to visit many Pentecostal churches where you are. And you see that what they do in times of what we call aesthetics and uh, PR and public something is so fantastic. Sometimes in our churches we are poor. Our church is dirty. Our church has nothing to capture people. Young people, they, they, they are, their senses is different from the way the old man. Bright colors and everything. I'm not saying those things are the gospel, no. But they are part of what captures people's mind and attention. So the Pentecostal man understands that first I must capture the attention of these people. When I can catch them to sit down, then I can talk to them. It's like entering a restaurant and there are flies and there is a dog, there is a cat, there are dirty plates. Will you sit down to eat there? But when you enter a place and it's neat, sparkling neat, when you sit down and they tell you what you have eaten is 2,000, will you argue? You will pay. Whether the money is there or not. Some of our young people in university, they don't have money. But because they want to impress their, their friends, what do they do? They take them to all these uh, restaurants, uh, Chicken Republic and this one, for a fizzy. Meanwhile, they can eat at Mama, Mama Put. But they say, let's go for a fizzy. Our church, our fizzy is very small. Put more a fizzy. Put more style. Put more wisdom. Put more variety. You know, make people understand that they have not come to see a dead man. They've come to see a living Christ. Last one. For those from up. You know, you said, you said it also. The major problem or the major reason why our youth leave our church is from we, the clergy. Let's face the reality of it. Yeah. Yeah. The reason, the, the reason be that we are not strategical in our arrangement. You're right. Samiras. Number two is that we don't carry majority of them along You're in right. our activities. You're right. Uh, and if we must retain them, we have to go back to where we are getting it wrong. Because those churches, they, they studied us. 
they and they come, they dwell on our weak areas exactly. to get our youth exactly. to them. So that they will say there's nothing you do in your church that we are not doing in our own church. We can right. even do better. I will not mention a particular church that uses our BCP. You're very correct, sir. The next question, yes, what Lord. concrete suggestions we are suggest now? Um, he, has, he has made one already. They are all tied together. My Lord, thank you, sir. Teaching, sir. Teaching. Our youth are confused. They we are have confused. a lot of things in our church that they don't understand. Yes. From the colors that we put on the church, yes. a lot of things they don't understand. Yes. They are confused with our structures. You are correct. They need to be taught and enlightened. You are very correct. Thank you, my The dear. Roman Catholic Church teaches her people. And that's why they stay in their church. See, how many of you come to, even to our church anytime you enter and you genuflect like this? How many of you? Even as clergy. Because you don't believe in it. You think it's nonsense. But no one enters the palace of a king without buying to the king. There's the king of kings, the lord of lords, over there. Yes, he's not there physically, but we're saying symbolically. His presence is here. When you come, you bow. Even in entering the altar ordinarily as a clergyman in the morning to pick something, you bow. You reference his presence. Oh, we don't believe in it. How do we teach people? The Roman Catholic Church spends time teaching them in their catechism and in all whatever they do, and those people will remain. Look, stand with the Roman Catholic and try to argue with him about Reverend Father or anything. He will, he will, he will fight you. But stand with an Anglican person and talk about bishop or the pastor. That is a good topic for discussion. He say, yes, our bishop is a thief. Yes, our bishop's wife is even terrible. Yes, our pastor ah, is a rogue. Have you ever heard any Roman Catholic talk about their pastor? Any Pentecostal talk about their pastor? With all that is happening in the church today, how many people in Pentecostal have talked about their pastor? None. But we Anglican, what do we do? We get basket mouth, diarrhea mouth. Why? Because we have not taught our members what we believe in and why we do what we do. Okay, I'll, are you from up? Okay, I'll give you. But we're going to take the last question now. And they're all tied together. We're answering them already. So I'll let you speak. Yeah, let him speak. One of the solutions is that okay, we, need Father. To, we need to pay attention to our Sunday school. Good. Because the way we bring them up is the key. When you go to churches, you find out the Sunday school. The teachers who are there, what are they teaching? What are they teaching? We have a good manual for the teaching. But yes. are they really teaching? Oh, yes. What are they teaching? Since the youth from childhood do not know the beauty of the Anglican heritage, they can be deceived You're right. at any time. You're right. Going to Roman Catholic from age three, they start teaching Catholicism. By the time that child will reach 12 years, no amount of preaching that would deceive that would him change. to another church. Thank you, thank you, Father. Because of time. People of God, I'm a proud Anglican. I've been Anglican all my life. And I will die as an Anglican. I'm proud of it. And I believe in Anglicanism purely, fully, and complete. But let me say to you, Nothing is wrong with our church. Nothing is wrong with our structure. Nothing wrong with our prayer book. But the operators of this structure may have a problem. And once the operator has a problem, whatever the, the machine delivers would be also faulty. For instance, your ATM card is okay, nothing wrong with it. Your bank account is loaded with money, nothing wrong with it. But if you put your ATM in a faulty ATM machine, your, your, your ATM card, what happens? It, 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 it can one, it can say insufficient funds, and also it can decline, am I correct? And it can even swallow your card. So each time you are a faulty operator of the prayer book, of the liturgy, of the structures of our church, what do you do to people? insufficient fund <laughs> you decline and then you swallow them and both of you go to hellfire god forbid in jesus name let's take our conclusion because of time please i want to read that for you false prophets and false teachers will always be there 
What we need is vibrant and radical teachers who will be effective in combating them. We need to invest seriously in raising the next generation of committed Christians, stroke Anglicans, please note that, who are prepared to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. The Anglican clergyman must be effective in pursuing this as he and his family constantly shine as light in the minds in the midst of darkness. It is the duty of the clergyman to not hesitate to preach any sin that will be helpful to his members, but teach them publicly and from house to house. Declare to all that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. However, to consider his life was nothing. If only he may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given him. The task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Therefore, at the end of his ministry, be able to declare that he is innocent of the blood of all men. For he has not hesitated to proclaim the whole will of God. And that's Acts chapter 20, verse 20 to 27, paraphrased for you. The heart of pastoral ministry for Paul is preaching the gospel. Not just the pulpit ministry, but in every way possible. People of God, there are platforms for doing that in our church. Baptismal classes, premarital counseling classes, confirmation classes. There are platforms of discipleship, of teaching, of preaching. Occasional services, burial services, wedding services, thanksgiving services are platforms to do what? To declare the mind of God. When you are in a burial service, please leave the dead man, dead woman alone. No matter what good you spend saying about them, they will never come back to life. Speak to the living and forget the dead. The proclamation of the true gospel, sound doctrine, is the only way to combat false teachings and heresy. This preaching must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit alone. The gospel we preach is that which has been handed over to us by those who came before. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This is the apostolic teaching for which many have died and still are dying. This is the job of blood when i say blood souls of men are tied to it in the course of the ministry lives can be lost it can mean death not just suffering our job as effective ministers in the 21st century is to preach the word in season and out of season doesn't matter who is seated doesn't matter who is listening doesn't matter who that person is your job as a clergyman is to preach the gospel without employing man-made methods old wise fables magical powers unconventional methods preaching and teaching the full doctrine of the faith without addition or subtraction is our responsibility this we must do to the end of our ministry and our lives brothers your ministry is not dependent on the next person if you have got a ministry pursue your ministry and make full proof of that ministry. Listen, we are bishops by the grace of God, but our job is not to hinder you. Our job is to facilitate you and to assist you. And if you think your bishop is a problem, pray about it. Hello? Pray about it. If you've got a ministry, pray about it. And if you are in the wrong diocese, God will relocate you to a better diocese. When I say better diocese, where you can fulfill your ministry. <laughs> when I talk like this, I'm sure I'm in trouble. But the truth is that, for me, it's not about persons, about anything. It's about the gospel. Simple, pure, and straight. The person who sent this question, please see me after. There's no time. Please, I need to understand this better. When you handle the word of truth, let that truth come out. Please see me later after the study. We can discuss much more. Can we stand to read our memory verse? Second Timothy 2.15. One, two, go. Father, we give you praise and give you honor. And we ask that you help us where we've been weak. Please make us strong. Where we have erred, please forgive us. Renew our strength, renew our vision, 
our calling and anointing and set us for better ministry for your people and for your glory in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit You can do better than that, church. Please, let's do better than that. Appreciate our Father in God for that wonderful teaching. Thank you very much. Please be seated. Like we said, we have some catching up of time to do today. As you know, our Father, the private of our church, our Father, the Most Reverend Henry Ndukuba, is on his way here. And there is a time allotted for that program. And that program is coming up by 11.30. So whatever we are going to do today, we just have to show that we are very disciplined, we are very effective fathers of the church in times of management of our time. So please, we are going to go for a short break. But before then, I want to say that... Um, by 10 o'clock, we are supposed to have our first lecture, uh, which is on, as the Father sent me, even so I'm sending you. Is it not? You have it in your program? But there is going to be a change. The, the people who are the resource persons that are supposed to speak, Venerable Fuebu and the Reverend Canon Timothy Olonade, they are on another assignment by the church father. So they will be here tomorrow. So the bishop of our will be coming up to take his own lecture too for today at that particular time. And his lecture is on celebrating the Anglican heritage. And to support that talk, he has already a book in circulation, not from today. In case you don't have it, it's, it's time to celebrating the Anglican heritage. So please, after his talk, please try to get one. And the amount is only 1,500 naira only. One five. Uh -huh. I know how you will murmur. Issue of money. <laughs> the Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Um, perhaps you need a copy, you can get one from Reverend Ogundare. Please, are you in the church, Reverend Ogundare, so that people can see you and maybe note where, where are you? Okay, he's up there. Uh, so please, you get a copy. And his driver, the Baba's driver, will be around hopefully throughout the program. It's just one five. People of God, we want you to go for breakfast. But before you go, know that we need to pray for our brethren that are on their way coming some could not come yesterday you all know why and some that were coming they had an accident uh, so please pray for those ones that god will strengthen them so on behalf of the planning committee we want to appreciate our father the bishop akobe for this wonderful foundation he has so led let us appreciate him once more and pray that tomorrow it will be better. Amen. All right. Please, I'm being told that some of us have no tag and they are having difficulties entering this uh, venue. So please get your coordinators. All the files have been given to your coordinators get make sure that you go out to meet your people so that they can be allowed to come into the venue so by the grace of god this is just um, 9 25 please let's be back by 9 40 and then we take the next program Thanks. all anglican clergy conference for tackle 2021 with a theme effective anglican ministry in the 21st century text first timothy chapters 4 verse 6 date 24 to 27 august 2021 venue st paul's cathedral jobu patakot featuring bible studies lectures seminars and revival sections 
Chief Host, Most Reverend Henry Ndokoba, Archbishop Metropolitan and Primate of All Nigeria. Host, Most Reverend the Church of Nigeria Anglican Communion presents All Anglican Clergy Conference for Tarkot 2021 with a theme effective anglican ministry in the 21st century text first timothy chapters 4 verse 6 date 24 to 27th august 2021 venue st paul's cathedral jobu patakot featuring bible studies lectures seminars and revival sections chief host most reverend henry Ndokoba, archbishop